uh, let me introduce today's speaker. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Matt Wedstein, uh, I guess must have grown up in the Midwest, like myself, in Illinois, apparently, because he got his bachelor's degree at the University of St. Francis in Illinois, and then did his graduate work, a master's degree and a PhD at Northern Illinois University. Uh, he came to California to start a professorial position at Delta College in Stockton, and there became much involved in the administration of the campus and rose to the rank of vice president of instruction and planning. And about three years ago, we were able to attract him to Santa Cruz, and he is now the president of Cabrillo College. Hey. So this is really, really an honor that he can join us. You know, we, we have as many members with connections to Cabrillo as we have to UCSC. And we've always viewed this very much as a, as a partner campus. Uh, my own career, I taught biology, these very large biology <laughs> classes. And many, many of my students got their first two years of science training as Cabri at Cabrillo, and they were really very well-prepared students. So we um, wanted to him to, to talk to us about, among other things, his academic work. And he has been in political science. He uh, wrote a, a major book on the abortion politics issue, uh, maybe a rather delicate issue in some ways, but clearly an important one and one that may get into the news very much in the future. And today the timing is perfect because we just finished uh, Arthur Ralston's course on Supreme Court deci decisions in the US. Uh, this is an area of expertise for Dr. Reitstein. So, so please welcome Matt. Well, thank you, uh, Barry, for the introduction and for um, inviting me to come. Um, always good to hear about our students doing so well when they transfer on. We're, we're very proud of their success. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen. Hopefully that's going to work. I have a PowerPoint to walk through. So, um, yep, it's good. See that, hopefully. And just a moment, I'll go into full screen. How do we look now? Good? Perfect. Okay, well, thank you, Barry. And uh, I, I am going to talk about politics and ideology in the two courts. Um, I will confess to being um, somewhat more versed in the Canadian court through a, a series of events that uh, led me to do research with my, uh, my partner and wife, Cindy Osberg. So for about 25, almost 30 years now, we have been doing work in comparative constitutional law and judicial decision making with a, a real emphasis on the Canadian court. Uh, but we do obviously have to make some connections to the US court, which I'll be doing today. So the outline of my topic or my talk is going to uh, focus on ideology as a force in decision making and why we might expect ideology to show up, not just in US Supreme Court decision case, um, cases, but also in Canadian cases. Uh, I'll do a little bit of a critique of that argument so that you can get a, a, a sort of a balanced perspective on whether um, this really should apply in other common law courts, as we call them. Uh, and then we'll talk about some of the, the methods that we've used, Cindy and I, to study ideology and judicial decision making in, the, in Canada particularly. Um, and I want to make sure we have time for questions. So Barry, make sure that uh, what's my time limit and, and when should I stop? Well, we, we usually stop at noon. So we've got an hour and 10 minutes. Uh, uh, so we, we've got lots of time. And, and, really and I guarantee time. you that people will ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. We will have plenty of time for Q&A for sure. Yes. All right. Well, so let me lay out the argument for why ideology and why political scientists, particularly who study the court, focus on ideology as a, a decision force. Uh, and I'm going to borrow a lot of this um, approach from a, a classic work that was done in the early 90s, stemming out of some work in the 80s, called the Supreme Court and the Attitudinal Model that was done by Siegel and Spade. And the argument that they advanced was one that tracked back to the Roosevelt era court all the way up to the current, at that time, the current court, the Rehnquist court at that time. 
And the argument that they made was that, look, once cases get to the Supreme Court, there really are precedents on, on, the, on most of these cases on both sides of the argument. And that is to say that these are the hard ones. If they weren't so hard, they wouldn't be making it all the way up to the Supreme Court. And so you've got legitimate reasons that can be written on either side of a dispute that typically comes to the Supreme Court, and particularly in the hard ones that are constitutional um, rights and liberties, things like that. And I know that some of you have been participating in the historic cases um, class. Cases like Brown, um, while unanimous, obviously have arguments pro and con that track back through history back as far as you go to even Dred Scott. So the argument that a lot of political scientists advance is that the, the values and attitudes that justices bring to the court are, are bound to shape the way that they decide the cases and the way that they write their opinions. That's why you see Republican presidents try to appoint Republican or conservative leaning justices. And that's why you see Democratic presidents and liberal leaning presidents try to appoint liberal justices to the court. And so the argument is that because members of the court have a lifetime appointment, they don't really aspire to be uh, any other kind of politician or rise to a higher office. They're really free to vote their values in a way that maybe other politicians in other branches don't have to think about. So the argument that they advanced was what is typically known as the attitudinal model of decision making, that ideology, particularly as a big force in, in shaping attitudes, drives a lot of what, what you see coming out of Supreme Court decisions. And there's this wonderful quote in their book from that period. This is in 1993 that they were writing. And they speculated at the time and said that, look, if there's a case that's going to turn the outcome of a presidential election that should somehow come to the Supreme Court, they argued at that time, it's, it might well turn on the personal preferences of the justices. Well, you all know that seven years later in 2000, that the 2000 election was disputed with the Florida ballot controversy. And not to their surprise, they saw a five to four conservative majority decide that Supreme Court decision on the Florida recount process, essentially tossing the election outcome to the Republican candidate. And so there's a nice visual that, that you have there of the, the court at that time in its for the court opinion, indicating that five of the justices signed on to the argument that there were no other methods that could be used um, in the Florida recount process that could fall within and take place within the time limits that were embedded in the federal statute for uh, finishing the electoral college certification process. The five conservative justices, and of course the four more liberal justices uh, found reasons and precedent to make the opposite argument. So that's the, the contours of the ideological argument. And I, I now wanna show you a graph that tries to track this notion of political ideology over time. And so this is a, a graph that's embedded um, in the work of Andrew Martin and Kevin Quinn, two political scientists affiliated with uh, and, and law school professors at Washington University in St. Louis. And Martin and Quinn have run what they call uh, Monte Carlo simulations, mathematical modeling to try to tease out who are the most liberal justices over time, who are the most conservative, and how do they trend over time in their ideological leanings? If you, if you sort of code cases as either liberal or conservative outcomes, what does that look like over time? And so they have these wonderful graphs that they've done of the justices. And I just wanna highlight a couple of things. These may be difficult to see on your screen, but I just wanna show you at the top here where my arrow might be circling is Rehnquist, who comes onto the court in the late 60s, um, Warren Court, Burger Court. Uh, and then you can see that at the top of this graph, you see more conservative justices. At the bottom of the graph, you see more liberal justices as they go through time. And so Rehnquist, you see his trend pretty much stay conservative, kind of floating around this four point. 
But then over time, as he becomes chief, the black line starts to, to occur. That's when he is the chief justice of the court. And you can see it sort of trending a little more liberal as we get into the early 90s and, and moving forward. What's interesting also to track on this is the replacement of particular justices and the ideological predisposition that they had relative to the replacement who comes onto the court. So there are a couple that I really want to highlight here. You all may remember Thurgood Marshall serving on the court. His line is down here in the sky blue color, becoming more and more liberal as you go through the Warren Court rulings that, that give us all of the rights and, and privileges relating to privacy rights in Roe versus Wade, um, all of the criminal due process rights, such as Miranda. And so Marshall leaves the court in the mid 80s, or excuse me, right around 1990. And of course he's replaced by Clarence Thomas uh, when President Bush named Thomas to the court. Look at the jump or the gap in liberal versus conservative decision-making that occurs by that single replacement. It's one of the largest shifts in ideology that you could ever see in the court by a replacement of a particular justice. So Clarence Thomas coming onto the court comes in as the most conservative justice, having taken the seat of one of the most liberal and continues to be uh, increasingly throughout time and even to this day, the most conservative justice on the Supreme Court, according to this mathematical modeling by Martin and Quinn. So now we come forward and you can see, if I point out Ginsburg as sort of this orangish color trending through time out to this spot right here, now she is replaced and it's very likely that her replacement will jump up into this zone around Alito, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh. Um, so what's interesting about this approach is that from a political science perspective, there's a lot of emphasis on how did the decisions fall along an ideological spectrum of liberal versus conservative output. Many law professors would bristle at that and question how do you code certain cases as falling liberal or conservative in, in some of the more arcane areas. But this is a, an enterprise, a, a body of scholarship that's been going on now for 30, 40 years in what's known as the Supreme Court Database Project that Harold Spaeth actually started back in the 1970s. Uh, and it was something that Cindy and I, as young scholars, really latched onto and said, hey, what if we tried to do the same thing in Canada and started coding the, the justices and their output and their decisions as either liberal or conservative? So, Let's step back a little bit and think about, well, why should ideology matter in a country like Canada? Sure, it might happen in the US. It's a polarized electorate. The appointment process is really ideologically polarized. But should that apply in Canada? Well, there are some similarities that suggest why it should matter, ideology in Canada. So first of all, it's very similar. It's a nine member court, very different. They wear uh, robes that look like Santa suits, but uh, that's a little bit different. Um, they don't serve for life, so we do have a distinction there. There is a, a law in Canada that basically terms out Supreme Court justices at the age of 75. Um, some would think that's a good approach uh, in the U.S. Others might say, boy, if you did that, you'd lose many of the great years' work of Justice Stevens and Ginsburg, for example, who had many years on the court beyond the age of 75. Having said that, there are a lot of similarities in the kinds of cases that the courts decide. Um, the issues are very similar in terms of commercial law, real estate law, except that in Quebec, you do have that difference of French civil law tradition. Uh, but generally, the constitutional cases align really similarly uh, in Canada and the US. It's a country that's largely dominated by two political parties. There have been um, strands of third party uh, dominance in Canada or, or um, coming up in Canada, but largely it's a um, conservative party versus liberal party uh, dichotomy in Canadian national elections. 
Similarly to US, they cannot be removed from office un unless they reach the age of 75. Uh, and they have control of their docket with one particular asterisk that I wanna point out there. And that is that criminal cases, some of them in Canada have as of right, a right of appeal to the Supreme Court if there is a split vote within the lower court in the appellate court of a, a province, there is an as of right appeal process that the court has to take those cases to decide uh, finally on the dispute. So the other thing to note while I'm talking about Canada's court is that you'll notice that in the picture uh, that there are four female justices. And I wanna highlight that as a true distinction between the, the more I would say progressive um, orientation of the prime ministers in Canada versus what's happened in our country. Uh, we have four in Canada, 10 females, women have served on the court and Canada has had a female chief justice up until the year 2017. So between 2000 and 2017, Beverly McLaughlin served as the, the chief justice of Canada. And she is um, quite historic the first female chief to ever uh, preside over a common law court uh, in a common law country, and the longest serving Canadian justice ever to serve on the Canadian court was Beverly McLaughlin. Uh, more on uh, the, the impact of women in a moment. So let me talk about a little bit of a critique of maybe why um, ideology would not be a force in Canada. And this is also a critique that is sometimes applied in the US setting. And it comes out of what's called uh, the law school model of conceptualizing what judges do. And the argument here from law school professors would be, look, what judges do or justices on the Supreme Court is really try to take the facts of a case and apply precedents and apply the statute or the plain meaning of a law or the constitution to that particular case at hand. So this idea that they bring their ideology into the toolbox and, and sort of craft whatever they're trying to do through their ideological lens needs to be tempered because they would argue that that's not what judges are about. They're not political animals. They're not ideological um, animals. They're there to apply case facts to law and statute and plain meaning. So Typically, you'll see this divide between scholars from a law school perspective versus political science perspective. And it is true that precedents are important. You can't just reason your way to an outcome saying, well, this is the way it should be because I say so. The precedents do put some guardrails on what justices can do. And I think even attitudinal scholars acknowledge that. But there's another reason in Canada that I think um, some scholars would say ideology is less important. And that's because in Canada, their argument is that that notion of being attentive to the role of a judge and not allowing ideology to enter in is much more prominent in Canada. And they are much more deferential in a parliamentary system where it's very easy for a parliament and a prime minister to react to a quote unquote, bad ruling by the court uh, and overturn that ruling with a simple change in the law. Uh, and so the parliamentary system that you have in Canada encourages more deference to parliamentary law or statutes that are coming out of the province. Another thing that we've seen in our research over 30 years now is that if you look at what the Canadian justices do in their writing and in their speeches, they're just simply better people to each other. They're more consensual. They're less willing to um, be hypercritical of perhaps opponents who might be on the other side of the ideological um, continuum. They also agree more often. So there is this interesting um, level of unanimity within the Canadian court that is much higher than you would find in the US Supreme Court. So as an example, if, if you were to look at decisions coming out of the, the most recent term of the US Supreme Court, you might find, for example, that 40 to 50% of them have divided rulings and are not unanimous. In Canada, 70% of the rulings tend to be unanimous. 
So there's this distinction of consensual norms and operation within the court of wanting to reach um, unanimity more often. Driving part of that is a unique feature of Canada, and that's that the Supreme Court Chief Justice gets to strike the panels to structure the, the judges, the justices who are going to hear the case in panels of sizes of nine, seven, or five. So in some cases, the smaller number of justices hearing the case makes it easier to get to consensus and unanimity, we would argue. And in many of those cases where it's a five member panel, that is done intentionally to have three justices from Quebec and two non-Quebec justices decide cases that are coming out of Quebec appellate courts. So that there's always a majority in those cases where a Quebec issue is really important to Quebecers, that they will make a five member panel and make it easier to reach unanimity. So having said all of that, the general tenor of the literature and our findings um, combined with it is that when you look at Canadian justices compared against the US court, they are far more um, consensual. They are less likely to have ideological be a driving influence. Although we would say from our research, it's there, it's just less prominent than you would find in the US setting. So how do we come to that conclusion? Um, well, one other thing, let me just close with this thought about ideology and particularly in relation to Canada um, and why it's an important ongoing concern. So prime ministers in Canada have a similar kind of appointment power as presidents in the US. They have the power of appointment. What's different is that they really have ultimate power over this process. And there is no parliamentary sort of hearings in the way that Senate confirmation takes place in the United States setting. So appointment to the Supreme Court is really a prime minister function. They have control over it. They can run it through uh, and do as they please. And this became hyper political in uh, 2013 when a member of the Quebec, um, the three Quebec justices had retired from the court, Stephen Harper, who was the conservative prime minister, made an effort to appoint uh, a federal court justice, just judge and elevate Mark Nadon to the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, Nadon had been uh, lived in Quebec, born in Quebec, practiced law in Quebec, but his prior work uh, before coming onto the court was on the Federal Court of Appeal in Ottawa. The appointment went all the way to the point of Nadon having an office established in the Supreme Court building when a Quebec attorney brought forward a constitutional claim arguing that under, not a constitutional claim, a legal claim, arguing that under Canada law, a Supreme Court justice filling a Quebec seat must come from the Quebec bar and having either been a Quebec attorney or a Quebec appellate court judge or Quebec judge, which Nadon was not. There was an incredible constitutional case where the federal government, the Harper government had to do what's called a reference case for the Supreme Court to decide whether or not Nadon could take the seat as a justice with the federal government arguing he could, he had been a member of the Quebec bar, had served as a federal judge and so on. The Supreme Court voted six to one saying, no, he was not a member of the Qu Quebec bar when you made the appointment. He was not serving on the Quebec courts and therefore they rejected the appointment much to the chagrin, chagrin of uh, Stephen Harper. So, this concern about ideology persists even within Canada because the only reason to put Nadon on the court was that Harper knew how conservative he was as a justice in, or as a judge in the federal courts. So he was aligned with the ideology of the prime minister. He was experienced as a judge. Harper thought Here's a great way to tilt that seat a little bit in the conservative direction. And to the Supreme Court's credit, they said, no, 
you can't do that. You have to follow the law. So this fear of unchecked power for prime ministers to make these kinds of appointments still remains in Canada. I will say it's less polarized than it is in the US. Uh, it's nothing like what we saw with Kavanaugh, uh, but it is still a fear. All right, so how do we do this? How do we decide if justices are actually ideological or not? Well, we follow a pattern of Siegel and Spaeth in the way that we try to capture at the time of their appointment, what do the newspapers say about a judge who's being elevated to the Supreme Court? So what we do is we read news stories uh, from papers drawn across Canada, uh, and we look at what experts, academics, lawyers have argued before the court say about the particular judge or the lawyer who might be appointed. We look for phrases like leans liberal, um, a centrist, middle of the road justice, or uh, progressive, or you know, very conservative on criminal issues. And we code those on a five point scale, negative two to positive two, in the same way that other scholars have done with the US nominations. Siegel and Spaeth have done this for years. Then what we do is we try to align, okay, what did people say about the justice when they were getting appointed? And then what do their votes look like when they start deciding cases? Uh, and so that means we have to code decisions. It's either leaning liberal or leaning conservative. And there are multiple ways that that's done across various kinds of cases, but here's a couple of ways to think of it. Take a criminal case involving a defendant who's making a constitutional claim about search and seizure, or right to counsel or whatever. If a justice rules on the side of the criminal defendant, we typically score that as a liberal ruling in favor of the rights of the defendant, much in the way that Miranda is seen as favoring the rights of defendants. Uh, however, if they rule in the favor of the government and against the criminal defendant, we categorize that as conservative. And you can do that across all kinds of disputes in economic cases, union versus management, um, people alleging discrimination versus the government. And so that's essentially the work of coding the votes of the justices across all of these cases. And our research questions are, well, okay, do prime ministers appoint people who align with the party or political or ideological disposition of their, their party? Um, when they vote in disagreement, so when there's non-unanimous cases and there's a split within the court, can we say that ideology is driving a part of that split between the justices? And in what kinds of cases does that happen? Does it happen in environmental disputes, in criminal disputes, in civil rights and liberties, in economic disputes, and so on? So that's the, the approach that we take. And now I'm gonna show some graphs and data that are based on our mathematical analysis of all of the rulings. And I'll just stop for a second and say, we're now at a point where we've coded, Cindy and I, uh, more than probably around 2,800 cases uh, 75 different variables, depending on the just, justices, the parties, the interveners in the case, who's arguing, um, what province do they come, up, come from, and so on. So it's a database that runs from 1973 pretty much to 2017. So we're a couple of years behind in encoding some of the more recent cases. So here's a, an example of some of the work that we can um, produce from this. You're not gonna be able to read possibly the names of the justices, but I wanna describe what you're looking at here. I mentioned that we have a scale that runs from negative two to positive two or along the bottom here. That's a five point scale of ideology as we see it when they were appointed as justices. So at the top you have justices appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada in blue who were appointed by Liberal Party prime ministers and you're seeing our score of them at the time of their appointment of what we thought their ideological leaning would be. The farther blue out uh, actually to this side of the screen means they're more liberal in our, our conception. And you can see a few of them here who are light blue kind of moving over into the the conservative side of the scale. So you have a, a somewhat conservative appointment by a Liberal Party Prime Minister. Then when you get to the bottom half of this table, 
you have appointments made by conservative prime ministers um, that you should see kind of congregating over on the other side of this graph, right? So they should be more conservative in their ideological leaning. And one of the things you'll notice here at the start of this graph is that generally that's a pattern that applies. Liberal justices are appointed by liberal party prime ministers, but not always. And it's interesting that this set that's in the middle here are predominantly Mulroney appointees from the 80s, who was a very sort of progressive conservative prime minister who made an effort, I would say, and we would say, to appoint more liberal leaning justices than he might have expected from the party of his, um, his politics, his leanings. But generally what we find when you sort of sort these and array these justices along the scale, uh, we do find that there's a higher um, newspaper ideology score for liberal leaning justices uh, than conservative justices. So the difference is 0.6 roughly around here versus 0.2, roughly around here for the conservative mean. So as a, a, a simple test, there does appear to be an association between our measure of ideology and the party leanings of the prime ministers. Here's another way to think of this now once the justices get on the court. Okay, we've kind of assessed where we think their ideology is going to be based on the reporting at the time of their appointment. Well, how does that correlate with the actual voting patterns of justices as they decide the cases as they go through their career? So we've got a couple of, of uh, axes here. Here's our newspaper ideology score, negative two to positive two, running along the X axis, the bottom. And then we've categorized enviral, environmental cases whether or not justices voted liberal sort of pro-environment versus conservative, maybe not in favor of environmental claims. So the expectation here is if our theory is right that ideology matters, our scoring of the justices at the time of their appointment should show a line that goes up and to the right, where as you become more liberal or what we think is more liberal justice, we should see more pro-environmental rulings. And in fact, there's a slight relationship there. You can see that slope going up and to the right when you impose a, a line of best fit on the data. And the suggestion there is that as justices move about a point on our liberal scale, their voting for pro-environmental claims goes up about three and a half points, percentage points in their career voting record. Another way of saying that is if you take the most conservative justice versus the most liberal justice, and kind of do the math on that, they're going to be about 15 percentage points higher on their, their pro-environmental voting record as they go through their career. So a slight association, it's not perfect. And if you know anything about math and R-square values, R-square tries to categorize the proportion of variance in voting explained by, in this case, one variable, one indicator, which is our newspaper score we're only explaining about 16%, that 0.16 down there, 16% of the variance in the voting is being picked up, we would argue, by the ideology measure, which leaves a lot to be left explained by all those other factors that we were talking about earlier. Here's another one. This is voting on what we call equality cases, largely discrimination cases that have been brought by folks who've, who've argued either by age, sex, disability, um, gay, um, gay rights cases that they've been discriminated against in the marketplace or by government. So a vote in favor of that claimant seeking equality rights, we, we categorize as a liberal vote. And again, we find a good relationship, not strong, not huge, but it's a good upward slope. The more liberal leaning justices tend to side with the, um, the rights claimant in those cases. Now, here's one interesting distinction I want to point out about Canada that's fascinating for us and I think will be fascinating to watch in the US as we move forward with more women on the court. In Canada, the best predictor of a liberal vote in equality disputes or discrimination cases is whether or not the justice is male or female. 
it is the biggest driver of a pro equality vote. The women justices who have served on the court, and we, we argue that they have suffered discrimination, they know the impact of it, they are far more likely to vote in favor of rights claimants in these cases. 15% more likely simply just controlling for all other factors being a female justice on the Supreme Court. All right, so I want to take it to another level. There's a lot of numbers on this table. Uh, and I want to kind of characterize how we go about teasing out how we know ideology matters when there could be so many other factors that matter. So you're looking at a table that takes all of the criminal cases from 1973 to, to um, 2015. And tries to analyze how justices vote on a number of different characters of the case and the justices. So the ideological liberalism that you see going across the top row here refers to that ideology measure we've been talking about and had created. But we also throw into the model and say, well, wait a minute, what if, it's, what if there's a gender factor going on here and, and women are more likely to vote a particular way in criminal cases? What if there's a religious component of the justices' um, attitudes that shapes the way they vote? So we throw Catholic in as a, a test to see if Catholics vote different than non-Catholics. What if the um, justices from different regions vote differently? What if uh, it's the case that Ontario justices are more liberal than Westerners or uh, Atlantic Maritime um, justices and so on? What if they came out of private practice and don't really know criminal law? What if they taught law? Are law professors more liberal? In other words, if they have that in their background, does that influence their ideology? So we run what is called logistic regression, which is a, an effort mathematically to tease out the impact of each of these variables separately while controlling for the others to say, well, what's the probability of a vote if they are conservative? What's the probability of a vote if they're liberal? And how much does that change when controlling for all of these other factors in a particular case uh, that we're talking about? So one of the things I wanted to point out here is how strong ideology is as a driver of voting behavior in criminal cases. And all that this says is that um, as a conclusion from our data, Liberal justices, people we've coded as liberals coming onto the court, are 40% more likely to cast votes in favor of criminal defendants than conservative justices, even when controlling for all these other regional, religious, and other variables that might come into play. That's a pretty huge impact. And it's even bigger than the provincial sort of Ontario versus everybody else impact. So there is something to be said that there is a regional alignment or regional difference in voting among the justices. Ontario justices are more liberal, but even when you control for that, the ideological leanings of justices coming onto the court are a pretty big driver of criminal voting behavior. Now, one other thing I wanna make, um, one other point I want to make about this table gets at the ability to predict case outcomes correctly. And so there's this little um, indicator, the second row from the bottom, percent correctly predicted. So our mathematical modeling of all these factors tries to guess which way they're going to vote, liberal or conservative, in a case given these various characteristics of the justices. And we get 65% of those right. And that's a pretty good improvement over a model where you would just be guessing always conservative every time. So the improvement or reduction in error in our guessing strategy is pretty elevated. 28% improvement in a model like this using actual real world data. Uh, we were pretty blown away by how much ideology and all these various factors were for helping to predict the case outcomes correctly for each justice. Now, I point to that because the next one shows much worse data in terms of ideology's impact. And this is why I wanted to come back to 
it can it can matter less in other countries because you're talking about a different court system. So here we've taken, moving away from criminal cases, now we're looking at economic disputes, disputes that involve unions, economic disputes between companies, insurance companies, uh, medical companies, real estate, all kinds of different disputes. And what you see there is that the change in probability that ideology drives is so much smaller. Remember it was like 0.40 or 40% on the last slide. Here we're at a, you know, like a 10%, 11% change in probability moving from liberal to conservative. Um, and it's not really a big driver at all. Um, you see much bigger numbers for things like coming out of private practice, uh, coming from the West versus others, uh, versus Ontario, uh, and teaching law experience where liberal um, academic law professors tend to be um, actually more conservative in their decision making when they get on the court in economic cases. But check this out. There's really, you're only getting 56% of the votes right. It's a small improvement in the model. And so our conclusion there is, look, ideology is not really driving anything. There's something going on in these economic cases that we're not catching in being able to predict their votes better or more accurately. And I would argue that one of the things that comes in there is expertise in case law. So something we haven't talked about really yet is that the court and the prime ministers do pay attention to who's leaving the court in terms of the legal expertise that they had, much more so than the US court uh, and US presidents worrying about such things. Here's why I say this. Um, you have the civil law tradition and a French tradition that emanates from Quebec. And by law, you have to replace those Quebec justices with a new Quebecer. But on top of that, the court has a long running history of having really good experts in commercial law, things like real estate, trusts, family law, uh, on top of the other kind of constitutional law expertise you would see in US and in Canada as well. So that prime ministers are not only paying attention to ideology, they have to pay attention to regional balance. They also pay attention to legal expertise so that when the court is losing perhaps a, a good uh, justice who writes a lot of opinions in commercial law uh, or international law disputes, they want to be cognizant of not losing some of that expertise and perhaps replacing it with similar expertise. So in terms of making some broad conclusions uh, and then opening it up for questions, ideology is prominent. We think that prime ministers do pay attention to it, but they also have to pay attention to these other factors, region, legal expertise, and increasingly we would argue gender. Um, they do exhibit the justices, some of these ideological patterns that you see in the United States, but it's nowhere near the kind of ideological polarization you would find in the US. The strongest evidence comes in discrimination or in discrimination and equality cases and in the criminal um, cases that we talked about. Uh, but it's a lot more nuanced. It's less partisan and less polarized than it is on the US court. And so with that, I've got a few tidbits, um, sort of factoids to remember as we go into Q&A. Um, the, the criminal cases I mentioned earlier, often decided by five member panels. Uh, by law, the judges have to have three from Quebec. I talked about Beverly McLaughlin. And one interesting note uh, as we turn to Q&A, um, it is often the case that when Canadians are pulled over or read their rights, in the criminal due process protections, they will try to correct um, Mounties or local police to tell them that they're getting their rights read wrong to them. They, they see so many US procedural crime shows like Law and Order mm -hmm. that they, um, the Miranda rights are often confused. And so the, the Canadian police often have to say, no, we're reading the rights to you as they stand in Canada, which are very similar in terms of criminal due process rights. Um, and with that, I think I'll stop, Barry, and we'll open it up for question and answer. Okay, that was excellent, man. Uh, so okay. I'm going to, okay, stop your screen sharing there. And uh, 
let me go into the um, uh, I have a question. Unfortunately, my camera doesn't work. Okay, it's at Art? Arthur. Okay, Art, it's, Matt, this is the guy who taught the Supreme Court cases. Oh, don't tell. <laughs> don't tell. Uh, hi, Matt. I, I'm sorry, for some reason, my camera's not working today. Uh, right. By the way, I also taught at, at Cabrillo last spring. Uh, one right. of the professors had some serious mental illness, uh, medical illness, and I ended up taking his class over. Uh, yeah, Thank you, Art. One, of the things, one of the things that really interests me is, and that I've noticed on our court, is that when you say liberal conservative, sometimes there's a third, I see a third category going in there, which I would call libertarian, yes. which means that sometimes what you would think of as conservative doesn't turn out the way it seems, and what seems as liberal doesn't think it turns out the way it seems, because there's really so, another ideological force driving it. And I'm wondering, one, is this present in Canada? And by the way, it's a fascinating lecture because I knew nothing about the Canadian judicial system as I come into this. And I really appreciate the, the little bit that you've given me. Now I want to read more about it. Uh, but so one question is, to what extent <clears throat> does this libertarian uh, phenomenon that we see here in the States bear out in Canada? I remember I had some litigation and some cases when I was practiced law uh, that took place up in Calgary. And I remember talking with some fellows up there who were uh, pretty prominent senior partners in some of the major firms up there, uh, <clears throat> specifically the Growlings firm. And uh, I felt sense that there was a strong libertarian element in their conservatism that is, it wasn't necessarily consistent. Yes. So that's my question. Yes. You know, I, I'm tickled that you asked that because the um, the earlier book that Cindy and I did um, in 2007, which was titled "The Attitudinal Model," or excuse me, "Attitudinal Decision Making in Canada," actually uses a framework of four different ideological types, uh, and so that libertarian communitarian strand, along with liberal conservative, is something that we were interested in teasing out. Uh, and so just on a high level, what I would say is that you find a, a much more communitarian orientation in Canada relative to the United States. Uh, and one way to think of it is that um, the Canadians like to say this, that the U.S. was born out of revolution. And so you have this emphasis on, on rights, freedoms, and, and liberty in the United States that come out of that revolutionary period that get enshrined in the Bill of Rights, right? Uh, and so there's a much more libertarian strand, I think, in, in US decision-making, but it is there in Canada. What they would say though, is that Canada was not born out of revolution and the constitutional creed that sort of is, exists at the founding is peace, order, and good government. Those kinds of of values are much more on the communitarian side of a communitarian libertarian dimension, right? So what you, what you see coming out of that is um, greater interest in the common good, uh, in promoting the commonwealth, in making sure people don't fall behind, more, more spending and more progressive spending for the treatment of poor, and providing welfare assistance, for example, to individuals who might be suffering from poverty, um, less overt conflict. And what we find in um, some of our earlier work is that that libertarian communitarian dimension shows up in some of the cases that get decided by the court. And likewise, what's important about that too, and I'm glad you brought it up, is that sometimes justices can float, right? They can be conservative on particular criminal issues uh, and they might be particularly liberal on the right to free speech or free press, right? So you can't lock them into just saying always that they're always lockstep in this particular ideological quadrant. Right, I, 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 on the US court, I would put Kennedy in that, in, in, in that mold because especially if you look at his decisions in, in the Lawrence versus Texas case, uh, on 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 uh, regu on the state's ability to regulate sexual conduct, and of course right. on marriage equality, you have a purely libertarian perspective, uh, 
that is tinged with both conservative and liberal elements. Yes, I agree wholeheartedly. Okay, uh, Marjean, I think you had uh, your hand up there. Yeah, I have a question. Um, to what extent, if any, do you think the fact that Chief Justice Roberts sat in on the entire impeachment um, <clears throat> of Donald Trump, do you think that has had or will have any effect on the way Chief Justice Roberts uh, votes when it relates to Trump? I don't. I think, um, first of all, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist had to sit through the Clinton impeachment process. So it's a, a function of the role. Um, I, I find Roberts fascinating because I think that he is embodying some of the same characteristics that I would say McLaughlin embodied in Canada in wanting to be at the center of his court. So I, I'm really intrigued by the oral argument. Here's an example for um, the Affordable Care Act arguments that took place last week. I'm intrigued by the way that the questions that were put to the, the, um, the folks from, I believe it was from Texas and the advocates for striking down the Affordable Care Act kind of reflected a, a hesitancy and an unwillingness to step into the fray and say that the law should be wholly under, overturned. There were elements of his questions and Kavanaugh's that suggested a much more narrow um, desire to sever a part of, the, of a law that is unconstitutional and not throw the whole baby out with the bathwater. I think that there's a lot of that that will be going on. I'm hopeful that there's a lot of that that will be going on with Roberts. That he's mindful of his historical legacy, that it will be determined by the next couple of years, uh, and that in some ways he will be tempered to be playing a role in the way that Kennedy and O'Connor played centrist roles when they were on the court but he's got the advantage of being the chief. Uh, and so I, I have a feeling that Roberts and his unwillingness to strike down the, the Affordable Care Act earlier, and even I think in this current controversy, is gonna be emblematic of that kind of a willingness to be at the center and driving the historical um, reputation of the court. Now, having said that, you know, so Cindy and I were talking about abortion, for example, being on the court's docket this year. I, I don't think that you're going to see a wholesale rejection of Roe versus Wade. I think it's so embedded in our precedents and in our, our lexicon that it's just, it's a protected sort of holy precedent. You can't just go in and strike it down. I do think, however, that there will be chips and chipping away and further efforts by states to chip away at the Roe right um, that might be successful. Um, and I, I would defer to Art if he wants to chime in, but there are some super precedents that, that law professors and justices like to talk about. I think that some of those super precedents are going to remain super and protected. Cases like Obergefell, for example, it's hard to pull back the right to gay marriage, uh, which by the way, the Canadians did 10 years earlier than the United States did. But I just, think, I just can't see the court stepping in and trying to reverse a precedent like that. Okay, Barbara had a question uh, and unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, this is very fascinating. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm kind of curious about uh, the Canadian, the role of native Canadians and do, are there cases heard by Canadian courts, Supreme Court? Um, what is the, what's the effect been? What's the significance for them? The, so the first answer is yes. And there has been a profound shift in the treatment of native land claims that took place very recently as within the last three or four years. Uh, and I would highlight, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to turn to the book to find the particular case. But when we were finishing off the, the value change book in 2017, um, the court had a huge case from British Columbia involving a land claim uh, in 
that province that, and for years, uh, First Nations um, representatives and, and lawyers have been arguing for um, requirement of federal government and or provincial government consultation before development takes place on what they believe is their land. Um, that dispute in, in 20, um, I wanna say it's 2017, and I'm gonna look it up while we're between questions, essentially came down unanimously in favor of First Nations um, in the sense that governments in Canada are required by law, uh, according to the court's reading of the statute, and also by constitution. There are protections embedded within the constitution, and it's, I believe it's section 35, that require the governments to do um, due diligence and engage in consultation with tribal councils on development of tribal land. The reason that the case was so important in the, the British Columbia example is that the amount of territory that they were talking about was, if, if my memory serves me correctly, a quarter of the entire province being essentially put under that protection of, of First Nation consultation. Now, having said that, there's a long history of uh, abuse of First Nation children being put into schools, sex abuse, uh, and land claims that were ignored for many decades, uh, much like in our country. Uh, and it was somewhat historic when the Prime Minister Trudeau uh, acknowledged some of that mistreatment in religious schools and also acknowledged the land claims of First Nation people in Canada. Um, there is one justice who's recently elevated to the court, and I wanna make sure I get it right, um, who has come out of the, um, the Yukon and has great experience in native affairs or First Nation affairs. And that's Andromarsh Karakatsanis, who has a Greek background, but at one point served in the government um, for the Liberal government as a, a Deputy Attorney General and as a, a Minister of Native Affairs and actually served on the Yukon um, appellate, highest appellate court before coming on to the Supreme Court. So they've got an expert on the court in those areas and I think it's helping. She was elevated in 2011, if I, I remember correctly. Um, so before Beverly McLaughlin left the court in 2017 as chief and having her alongside Karakatsanis, they have had some pretty historic rulings that have gone in favor of First Nation rights. Okay, Ron had a question. Yes, uh, hi Matt. Um, the, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, mandatory retirement in the Canadian court, uh, Supreme Court is 75. And then you said that, imagine in our Supreme Court, if we had that, we would have lost some of the best years of, of uh, Ginsburg and, and maybe even some other justices. Yes. Is there any evidence though to the contrary? Yes, there is. Um, there, there's a wonderful anecdote, um, and I believe it was Justice Douglas, um, Art, you may correct me, it's either Douglas or Stewart, but one of the two justices that served on the court uh, during the 70s and 80s <clears throat> was on oxygen, even in oral argument, um, and probably well past the prime of serving as a justice. And um, so there's a delicate balance, I think, when, when that starts to happen and someone's health starts to deteriorate, where justices are, do, try to do two things. One is have a colleague on the court who's a confident, who can come to them and say, you know, it, may, it might be time. Uh, and also they rely on their medical advice that they get. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was just a, a model of incredible health despite suffering several bouts of cancer and you know having a father who passed away from pancreatic cancer to see what she did recovering from that and then still serving on the court is just remarkable but yeah there have been examples of that in the past all right i don't know if you want to weigh in on it not really i think you've covered it 
the identity yeah. of the justice, I can't think of it offhand, but there have been several instances uh, where this happened. Uh, and of course, you know, the, the, the Roosevelt court packing plan in, in 1937 was you know, predicated on age as well. Uh, and uh, it got shot down basically on, on that version. I mean, it, it was, it, that was clearly a trying to find some kind of, some reason other than the overt political reason that was behind it. Um, yeah, you know, one thing I'll add, Ron, too, is that the Blackman papers that are in the Library of Congress, Harry Blackman's uh, papers, are a treasure trove. And, and he liked to talk about what he did during oral argument to, he, he confessed sometimes to just stay awake. Uh, he would actually tally um, before going into um, the discussion with the other justices, he'd, he'd make a little check marks in his notes as the argument was going on, plus or minus where they thought, where he thought the justices were going to align. And some political scientists are now mining that data to have sort of contemporaneous notes of Blackman's assessment of the liberal leanings or conservative leanings of the justices. And to his credit, and he, re he did retire before, um, you know, getting too frail. But I remember seeing an interview he did with Nina Totenberg that suggested that he, you know, he chuckled about it, but I just have to do that because if I didn't do it, I, I literally would fall asleep sometimes with some of the arguments, so. Okay, so Garrett's asked ask a good question here. Do Canadian justices recognize the concept of originalism? <laughs> um, wonderful example, wonderful question. So that strand of thinking is evident in some of the justices' opinions. I would say, however, but that the bigger um, argument, quote unquote, within opinions is more about how much deference should be afforded to parliament and provinces versus non-deference. In some ways, there's an originalism um, living tree line that parallels that argument. So um, not always, but frequently, originalism gets associated with more conservative justices in the US setting. And I think likewise, when Canadian justices make an argument more on the side of deference, uh, and deference to parliamentary decision making and prime minister prime ministerial rule that is along that same parallel because activism well so I, I just want to draw a line on activism activism is the 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 belief that it's legitimate for justices to strike down laws as unconstitutional uh, and and it is it can be done on both sides of the political spectrum. Activism is um, sometimes used with the tool of originalism as the hammer that helps explain why you would wanna strike down a law. Sometimes not. Sometimes activism is done to say that we have to have a living tree, the constitution should be expanded and are thinking about it to expand to modern times and modern ways of thinking and therefore the living tree doctrine comes in. Um, so, the short answer in Canada is you see it come up sometimes, but the bigger argument tends to be over province and parliamentary power versus not having power. Okay, let, let me ask one. So Canada has this long connection to England. Is their legal system more like the US system or the English system? It, it, it is more like the English system, particularly up to the modern era, modern, I, I, I would, Cindy and I would draw, would draw a distinction, I think most Canadian scholars at 1949. And that is a, a, a demarcation point because it is the, the year in which Canadian cases no longer have to be referred from the Supreme Court to the Privy Council in England. So that total constitutional control and sort of finality on decisions really embarks from that point. So from 49 onward, and particularly since 1982, with the introduction of a Charter of Rights and Freedoms in their constitution, those breakpoints are, are making the court much more like um, the US court and much less like the English system. 
And here's another distinction I would point out. So the Privy Council break means that they no longer have their stuff appealed up to England or over to England in 1949. And now in 1982, they have constitutional rights very similar to the US Bill of Rights. So what happens in the period, particularly after 1982, is a greater interest in studying American US constitutional rulings. And a broader sweep of common law courts in how they decide cases. So one of the very interesting things that's different among Canadian justices versus most US justices is a willingness to look to other courts for precedent. So you look to other jurisdictions, New Zealand, England, Australia, the United States particularly for arguments by analogy on how those other courts have dealt with the issue. So the free speech and free press jurisprudence in Canada is very much grounded in US free speech and free press jurisprudence. Uh, and so you don't often see that in America except for Stephen Breyer, for example, who is much more cosmopolitan in citing other courts from around the world to find out how they're deciding these cases. Scalia hated that. <laughs> I mean, you know, the whole idea that you would rely on other countries' courts to drive what our court is doing was anathema for him. And there was a, a wonderful dispute that they would often have in, in joint appearances on internationalism, cosmopolitanism versus not. Um, and Scalia being much more of an originalist, look, it's our constitution. I don't care what the New Zealand court has said or the Canadian court. And Breyer is much more open to that cosmopolitan nature of thinking about other rulings from other courts. Same thing happens in the Canada court, very much so. Okay, uh, Todd, you had a question. Uh, I just wondered whether there are any examples uh, on the Canadian court for a racial uh, justice. You didn't mention race as one of the variables. It's less prominent in their decision making. What's more prominent is, and it's along the same lines, is um, the charter protection for um, uh, nation of origin. So there are protections embedded in the charter for uh, immigrants or um, having been born in other countries, obviously. And um, one of the famous cases that comes out of the late 80s was a, um, it was a lawyer of Indian descent, if I remember correctly, from India, um, who had been, for some reason, barred from practicing law uh, and challenged that and, and won big time in the Supreme Court. And so, Cases involving race and national origin, not very prominent because very early in the charter era, and I wanna say it was 1989, um, the court basically said, you can't discriminate against people based on that characteristic. And boom, it's done. It, it, you know, there's hardly anything that comes forward because it's settled law, if that makes sense. But my question is about the justices, not the cases. Oh, yeah. Um, they have, there has not been an um, African Canadian justice yet. There have been a, a series of appointments that come from um, linguistic and cultural minorities within Canada. So there has been, for example, um, right now, Rosie, Rosalia Bella is Jewish, but um, the first Jewish justice came much earlier, I want to say in the early 80s. Um, on the court right now, I'm looking down the list, Karakat Sana says Greek descent, Moldovar is um, of uh, Eastern European descent. Um, I don't know Kasserer's descent. He's a specialist in family law, but they have had um, Oh my gosh, uh, Sapinka was um, Croatian and that would have been around the late 80s. So what's, what's interesting about it is there have been a series of firsts that have been, have been like the first Greek Canadian, the first Ukrainian Canadian, the first um, 
um, Jewish Canadian, the first you know, that and not uh, African Canadian, not yet. Uh, my my quick look at some of your data suggests that justices tend to become more liberal as they age. Is that valid? That was the showing that you find in that Martin Quinn um, graphic. So the, the argument that Martin and Quinn are trying to advance is how do you compare a case decided in 19, let's say 90, with a case today? Given the, the principles being argued in the case and given the ideological range of the court that's deciding that case. So what Martin and Quinn are trying to do through a series of Monte Carlo simulations, so they're, they're basically trying to mathematically model all cases running from like the 1930s to present based on the legal issues at play, the parties who are litigating, and the range of the justices sitting on that panel during that case. And then trying to calibrate, well, um, a Warren of 1967 is as liberal as a Ginsburg of 2017, right? It's a very interesting mathematical modeling process. And so in their projections of that, they are showing that in many cases, particularly when you take some prominent people like Stevens, who was appointed by Gerald Ford, because more and more and more and more liberal over time in areas that are really important, like the death penalty, that that happens. And if you go back to that Martin Quinn graph, you see that show up a lot, that there's a liberalizing force that appears to happen while they are on the court. Um, and they're saying it's not just because they're getting more liberals that they're having to sit with, it's that it's happening over time. Um, you know, I, I think it's a somewhat of a parlor game. The math behind it, quite frankly, is above me. But um, it is an effort that they're trying to engage in to say, well, who's more liberal? Um, black men at this point in time or Rehnquist at this point in time? Mm -hmm. Okay, we're getting to the end here. I want I'm looking at this, my second page of pictures since I can't see you all or any any hands up for uh, Nancy? Okay, I missed you because you were on my second page here. Go ahead. And I, I think you're going to get the last question, okay. Nancy. Well, it's, it's a very quick. Thank you very much. That was really fascinating. Um, but if it's true that the justices get more liberal as they get older, then the 75-year cutoff <laughs> is the liberal part of their career. <laughs> so you have data on that? <laughs> um, you know, it's a great question. I think the Martin Quinn data, you could slice pre-age pre 75 and post-age 75. Mm. Uh, the one thing I'll say about this whole um, enterprise, both what Cindy and I do and Martin Quinn and other political scientists, step back and take a grain of salt, right? <laughs> so one criticism that you need to be aware of is, look, we're, we're going in and coding these cases and coding these justices one case at a time, and then we enter in, in our computer and when we run our math, right? Well, as Art would point out and has shown in his classes, cases aren't, ain't, ain't the same. Some cases are more important than others, right? So the whole enterprise is coding each individual case as a decision point in a parade of decision points that, that run back through time, right? And arguably, to, to Art's point and his whole thing around the classes is some of those decision points are really historic and mean a heck of a lot more than the mundane uh, property dispute that just got decided, right? So consider that in your thinking about how I'm talking about career trends in voting or how Martin and Quinn might portray them on a graph. Does it really matter if really there are such prominent historic decisions that come around maybe you know, once every decade or once every generation that really pinpoint the court as a historic maker of change? Those are the Browns, right? Those are the Roe versus Wades. 
uh, and it's not the everyday case that we just lump into the data set, right? So again, it's a, it's a critique of the entire method to recognize that some cases are much more important than others. I don't know if it was George Orwell who said that in animal farms. You know, some, some animals are more important than others. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Matt. That was really, really uh, excellent. That was um, great. Well, thank you, Matt. Okay. And very, much very much like to sit down with you sometime. <laughs> okay. A blast. We should connect for coffee. For sure. And right. let me say that um, I think that, you know, we're, we're a UCSC friends group, and we would really like to tap in more than we have to the pool of talent at, at Cabrillo, both, both as speakers for this meeting and possibly teachers in our course. And so I, I, I'm going to get back to you and just, just try and get some good ideas of people who would be, who would be good, good speakers for Oli. But uh, all right. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. That was great. And happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Absolutely. Absolutely. Stay safe. Stay well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.